So, one section that's interesting in this book, which is a uh, collection, a chronology of the life of Jesus, told by Stephen Mitchell, the scholar, and he does digressions as he talks about the subjects. He has a long introduction before he gets into the chronology. He does basically a 60-page introduction, then a 30-page summary of the gospel, and then uh, a chronology commentary, like five pages per uh, topic. So, how about the baptism? The baptism, I always felt, was something uh, anyone who's, you know, had a transmission experience from a teacher could relate to this. Um, so, this is in Mitchell's introduction. You know, we have to get beyond thinking of Jesus as superhuman. I always like to th imagine, could I recognize him if he was here? I mean, I've often wondered if fundamentalists, they think he would be so obvious to recognize, he'd be, you know, this superhuman aura, but I often wonder, could they recognize him? the reality of this person if they were there? Or would they be in the crowd yelling at him, you know, to be stoned or crucified? Something we should always uh, have a little humility about. Was Jesus superhuman? An idea he himself certainly didn't have. Why do you call me good, he once said to the earnest inquirer who called him good rabbi. No one is good except God alone. So his own view of himself, in his own view of himself, he undoubtedly felt like anyone who has spent a great amount of time in prayer and meditation, that he was just one partial expression of the divine whole. The moon reflected, however, clearly in a dewdrop. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's Mitchell putting his little Zen touch on it, the moon and the dewdrop, which is a profound teaching of Dogen. I mean, a profound reality that our consciousness, you know, is um, comes from the universe being reflected in our, our dewdrop body. But it is universal to see the moon's source even as we imagine ourselves to be confined by the dewdrop. So if the account of the official gospels does contain some authentic memory, what can the actual event have been like for Jesus? Here we have to look behind the mythologized language the sky splitting apart, the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. What are left? What we are left with is the voice of God in one of its myriad forms. Then he describes the situation of the... For many of these people, the baptism was undoubtedly a profound experience, but Jesus' experience must have been fundamentally different. Repentance can be a transitory emotion and the revival meeting is notorious for ecstasies that vanish at the threshold of the ego. Yeah, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And so Mitchell says, I see him as a sincere young man. On some unconscious level, he was still struggling with the pain of a childhood. And that that is something I appreciate. you got to realize he grew up as a, you know, as a bastard, his didn't, 
he was, you know, Mitchell, I think, alludes to who his biological father was. And the virgin birth myth, mythology, is something that really has corrupted the whole teaching. But possibly it was a Roman soldier. I think it's not unlikely because it was an occupied country. You get soldiers and what do they do, you know? <clears throat> so maybe Jesus was a half-breed and imagine growing up in a Jewish culture as a half-breed. That would be quite painful and that, you know, could inform his, uh, his, uh, you know, So then he encounters a, this teacher, <clears throat> the ferocious intensity of John, the first prophet he had ever met. Jesus looked into his eyes, or maybe he was thrust under the surface of the Jordan River. Something broke open, not in the heavens, but in his own heart. He felt an ecstatic release, a cleansing of those painfully hidden childhood emotions of humiliation and shame, of being a half-breed, a sense of being taken up once and for all into the embrace of God. You are my beloved son. This day I have begotten you. And then Mitchell says, the passage that sheds the most light on what this experience must have felt like is his parable of the prodigal son. So Mitchell thinks the prodigal son is a retelling of Jesus' own experience of being the prodigal son. And then he talks about echoes in the Lotus Sutra of Mahayana Buddhism. <laughs> but uh, one thing I appreciate in the baptism is it is a story of Shaktipat and Shaktipat is not un, uh, not an uncommon phenomenon where, you know, a, a seeker approaching a guru can evoke the teaching. Dogen says, teacher and student practice mutually. The student evokes the te teaching from the teacher. The teacher cannot withhold it if the student devotion and faith are sufficient, the teaching will be evoked involuntarily and Shaktipat, which is direct transmission, mind-to-mind -mind transmission, arises. And I have had a small experience of that, and I've read many accounts of it. You know, it's very common in uh, Indian traditions like with uh, Mir Baba at Shaktipat from the woman on the street who uh, threw a rock at him and hit him in the head. <laughs> and uh, so Shaktipat, I think this story of the baptism is a Shaktipat story where Jesus had direct transmission. And John the Baptist, this, you know, the teaching came even more profound than John the Baptist had. He probably was surprised too. But, uh, so that's a good um, way to understand the, uh, you know, the baptism, the beginning of Jesus' career. You know, it's an involuntary experience. He, he didn't know what was going to happen. He just heard Go to the river, and uh, and then you know, see what happens. <clears throat>